Well, hi again, wherever you are and whatever you're doing. Welcome to Unstoppable Mindset. Today, we get to interview Kobe Williams. And Kobe has a really great story to tell. He believes in working with uh, minority businesses and a variety of causes. He is a founder of New Reach Community Consulting, and he'll tell us about that. And so I don't want to give a whole lot away. I'm not going to going to tell you all about it because he will. So, Kobe, welcome to Unstoppable Mindset. Yes, thank you so much, Michael. It's a pleasure to uh, to join you. Well, if you would, why don't you start and kind of go back near the beginning and just tell us about your life a little bit growing up and how you sort of got where you are. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, I am uh, very proudly from uh, a neighborhood called Westwood in Cincinnati, Ohio. I lived in that neighborhood uh, just over 20 years of my life. Um, and my mother, a few years beyond that, uh, who is still still with us. And Westwood is a um it's a what you call i guess a challenge neighborhood would be the the term that would probably be used and it really fundamentally shaped a lot of the ideologies that i have a lot of the the passion that i have both just um not just professionally but also personally um you 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 name it i've seen it um in in that environment both the good, bad, and in between. And, you know, coming from an environment such as that, you know, it really helped shape, um, you know, what's possible. And also to question why things are, um, why are certain uh, individuals and populations and communities um, experiencing those, those challenges and most importantly, how can those uh, individuals and communities be empowered? And um, you know, what's the role that they can play and help uh, to to better those conditions? And you know, what are some of the systemic changes that can happen to better those conditions? So, uh, very much shaped, you know, who I am and and who I be uh, become. And you know, one thing I like to say is, you know, coming from an environment such as that, a lot of people. I say they, they either run from it or they lie about it. Um, and I, I very proudly wear that on my sleeve. And um, I'm very fortunate that the nature of my work still takes me to um, communities such as that, uh, either directly and or to help organizations engage with, um, with communities for, you know, what I just simply call social impact or, or social justice, you know, what are ways to help move different uh, communities forward? Well, what, what got you to do that? I mean, you, something made you make that decision or something in your life kind of turned your, your head to go there. What really got you to the point of truly being that concerned and interested in social justice and trying to make a difference in that way? You know, great question. I, I honestly, I cannot recall a, a moment per se. Um, I am a, uh, you know, self-admitted uh, nerd of, of many things, many, many subjects, many topics, but, um, you know, the, um, the civil rights movement was very, you know, I, I've studied that uh, growing up, which, you know, I'm, I'm quick to point out. Uh, did not start in the 1960s or 1950s, and it certainly did not end. Um, but, you know, learning about that, um, of what was taught in school, but largely, you know, self-taught or taught through my uh, community, and how many of those conditions just were, st were and still are uh, present. Um, you know, as I got older and you know, um, Cincinnati is, is, you know, my beloved hometown, but is uh, fairly tribal with, with our neighborhoods. And as I got older and got exposed to different neighborhoods and, you know, hey, every neighborhood isn't facing these challenges and, and why is that? Um, and so, you know, again, there wasn't a specific moment, I think, but just kind of just being exposed to different environments 
and tying that into, you know, history, um, you know, past or present and how, you know, some things unfortunately kind of have remained the same. And that really just, you know, I'm, I'm a big why person, you know, why is that the case? And, you know, what are some of the ways that I can be a, a drop in that bucket to help, um, you know, be, be a vessel is really how I view myself in my work to help, you know, make a difference with the finite time that, you know, I'm here on this earth. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's interesting. I think our environment does shape us a lot. You just said something um, I'd love you to expand on. You said that the civil rights movement didn't begin in the sixties or in the fifties. When would you say it began? Yeah. Um, you know, and that's something I, 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 stand tall in a soapbox on is, you know, uh, the first enslaved Africans uh, were brought here in the early 1600s. And I don't think that they were, in fact, I know they weren't very happy about their predicament. So I think it goes all the way back uh, to the to the early 1600s, um, at least the 1619s. Uh, so, yeah. you know, uh, yeah, it did, didn't start in the 1950s or, or 60s. I take it all the way back to the uh, early 1600s. I had a history teacher who talked about that, and I'm not sure I remember which class it was and which teacher it was, but he came in and he started telling a story about how a ship came in a harbor and the uh, the crew of the ship went below and they brought up all these people who look different because they were, as we now would say, people of color or African-Americans. And they said, and we brought these people over here. We're going to sell them to you so that you can use them as slaves and get things done. And that story has always stuck with me. And, and I, I would say in one sense, you're right, that the civil rights movement started then. But I take it back even further. Of course, I come from dealing with the community of persons with disabilities and specifically people who happen to be blind. And I would say it goes back far beyond that in terms of dealing with someone who's different. That is someone who happens to be blind. But the problem is that if you deal specifically with blindness, there are many fewer blind people than there are people who happen to be of a different color or um, of some other kind of a difference, which makes it tougher. But I would say as long as we've had differences, we've had people who have believed that we should be treating people more equally than we do. Well said, well said. And, and, and I also want to add, you know, um, you know, folks were brought here to, to an occupied land, right? This, this land was fu fully occupied uh, by our uh, brothers and sisters in the uh, indigenous and first nations community. So yeah, a lot of, uh, you know, un untold stories, unfortunately, with, you know, the, the origins and beginnings of, of uh, various civil rights movements and those intersex intersectionalities. Yeah, because in the case of, say, people with blindness, the perceptions were different. Well, they can't do anything, so we'll just really discount them. They need to stay at home and not stir anything up. And yes. occasionally some did. and have had some successes at it, but still there are so many issues dealing with people who are different. And it doesn't matter whether it's blindness, um, any other kind of disability, someone of a different color or whatever. A lot of the issue is that it's still fear. You know, we just yes. fear people who are different than we. Yes. Yes. Now let's talk about you specifically. I mean, if we're going to talk about you, we got to recognize the fact that you're as normal as they come. You like bourbon. <laughs> I am a bourbon boy. I, <laughs> I uh, love, love bourbon. I've uh, completed uh, most of the, the bourbon trail and the uh, kind of the greater Louisville area of uh, Louisville, Kentucky. And I have uh, sampled, I've lost count, but um, several dozen different labels at this point. Uh, however, not all at one time. That's 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 ah, something uh, I want to probably wanna point out. Yes, that's that's <laughs> helpful. But yes, I'm what's a your, lover of bourbon. What's your favorite? Oh, I can't do just one. I, yeah, I, I hear I, you. Um, I I can give you four or five that I that I enjoy. Um, 
love Woodford Reserve, uh, Eagle Rare, Buffalo Trace, uh, Weller's Special Reserve, and I, I'll give um, I love Wild Turkey. I, I like Wild Turkey as mm. well. Um, so bit of variety there, but yeah, I, I can't pick just one. And I like Maker's Mark, but I also definitely like Woodford and and a number of others. Of course, there's always the old common Jim Beam. Oh um, yes, yes. And <laughs> a few years ago, it seems to me as as I recall, there was some sort of an accident in a Jim Beam, um, whether it was a distillery or a shipment or something, caught fire, and that had to put a dent in everything for a while. And we were wondering where's our next bourbon coming from, but <laughs> we did survive. <laughs> yeah, they've had some. Um, uh, I think. Uh, tornadoes over over the years that has affected their supply chain too so and as we know uh but good bourbon takes um several years to 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 make i know there's i won't name name some bourbons are only aged for six months in a year or two and i i, I, I need six seven plus years on, on my bourbon well yeah <laughs> there, there's always seagrams but uh <laughs> That's a more of a blended thing, as I recall. Yes, I think you're right. I think you're right. However, um, just just demonstrating that that we all we all have great tastes, and and then there are those who don't like bourbon, and that's okay. We love them in our world as well. Yes, yes. <laughs> which is which is really important. Well, you have been very much involved in diversity and equity and inclusion and and really trying to advance it. What does all of that mean to you? Oh, wow. Um, and, you know, even to that point, I know that uh, particularly within the past couple of years, I think there's a, a, a fairly limited understanding of, of DE and I and equity and who and all that, that um, involves. And, um, you know, there are what's, you know, I call kind of the big eight, um, of which includes, you know, age, ability, race, ethnicity, uh, gender, sexual orientation, uh, socioeconomic status, and religion. And, you know, and within those kind of communities or, or populations, there's the, the haves and the have-nots on either mm -hmm. sides of, of um, that, that fence, if you will. And there's a lot of intersectionalities, you know, even within those groups. Um, I do say in, in my experience, opinion, and observation that uh, race does cut through each one of those. Um, however, it's also not to me about uh, the oppression Olympics. And, you know, it's, it's just who are the have nots? Um, why and how do they be become that? And how can that be? you know, um, corrected, addressed, or at the very least <clears throat> mitigated is, you know, uh, you know, when, you know, when I speak about social impact, that's really just a, you know, fancy word for a lot of the ugly things in, in this world. Um, and, you know, when we, when we talk about issues, which in my world, an issue is a problem with a solution, ultimately it are, it is, those folks, um, you know, on, on the margins or who have been placed in the margins that are, you know, uh, catching the most hell. And so that's where, generally speaking, a lot of the, the focus of my work uh, is really uh, concentrated on at, at the end of the day. Tell me a little bit more about what you do then and what your work is, if you would, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'm the owner and founder of New Reach Community Consulting. New Reach is a small business that provides public affairs consulting services to help organizations connect with communities for important causes. And uh, very proudly, New Reach is also a B Corp certified business. Um, B Corp is considered to be the gold standard for demonstrated social and environmental impact. Um, New Reach is uh, part of, uh, at this point, about 5,000 uh, B Corp uh, in the entire world. 
and one of only about a baker's dozen in Ohio and uh, about the same uh, black owned B Corps in the entire uh, United States. And the nature of um, you know, New Reach's work is really doing all things that I call community touching, be it behind the scenes or in front of the scenes. So it's developing strategies and approaches and implementing those um, at times to help organizations engage with communities. Um, the organizations that I um, work with are primarily public sector. So local, state, and occasionally federal government, as well as nonprofits or philanthropic type of organizations, be it foundations or just kind of community groups who might not have a formal structure, but they're trying to do some good um, in those communities. And you know, the, what my work looks like in a more practical sense is uh, stakeholder outreach and community engagement, uh, strategic planning and implementation, issue advocacy, capacity building, and uh, messaging and communications are kind of the general uh, kind of lanes or how my work looks like in, uh, in, in doing those, those activities. Would you tell me um, and our listeners maybe a, a few stories about some of the things that you've done, the successes that you've had, or um, attempts to have an impact on on society in that regard? Yeah, sure. Um, it can look in a variety of ways, uh, one of which is uh, working with a uh, local government to help engage the community for the development of their uh, climate action plan. Um, so, you know, um, who are the communities, again, generally catching the most hell or generally the marginalized communities, uh, typically around um, social uh, or socioeconomic class and or race, race and ethnicity. So I worked with uh, the local government to help engage the members of those communities to see um, this is what the city came up with as far as their climate action plan. Does this resonate with you? Does this mean anything to you? How would you prioritize these different activities that are being considered uh, to be implemented? And, you know, more importantly, you know, how can we engage you or the city engage you to help, um, you know, help them implement these plans? And something I'm very proud of, uh, I didn't have a direct role in this, but um, the community actually pushed back and said, you know, these, these goals and the climate action plan are not aggressive enough um, and more needs to be done. You know, we're already behind the eight ball, uh, you know, nationally or just kind of as a human race, more needs to be done. And uh, again, I didn't have direct involvement in that piece of it, but did smile when I read about that in the news that, the city actually said, you know what? Yes, we can and should do more to help um, offset some of these, these challenges that our communities are facing as a result of uh, climate change. So um, that's you know just one example of uh, certainly a weighty issue, um, but of how communities can be engaged and be empowered to uh, help put them and their communities in a, in a better place. How do we continue to deal with the whole issue of climate change when some of our elected officials, and I won't call them leaders because <laughs> I don't regard them as yeah. really leading, but they come back and they say, there's no such thing as climate change or we're not going to fund it. How do we get beyond that? You know, I'll, I'll start with, uh, uh, with, I think the messaging has, has evolved. I um, did some work in the, um, at the time was just environmental movement. Now it's kind of known as the environmental S sustainability movement. Right. And, you know, once upon a time, that movement kind of focused on what I call the, the birds, bees, and trees. And, you know, that really only resonated with and still does a, a finite population when you really talk about, you know, the, the, the topic in that way. And the messaging was also about uh, saving the planet. Certainly when I grew up, I'm an 80s baby. That was the thing is help save the planet. And mm -hmm. the messaging really evolved because at the end of the day, the planet does not need to be saved. The planet was around for billions of years before humans were a thing. And it will be around for billions of years afterwards. So it was really kind of an arrogant message. 
uh, we don't need to save the planet. We need to save ourselves. We need to, you know, in, in a way that um, uh, being custodians of the planet so that it, we can live on it. That's really the more accurate message. And then it became more about sustainability. So that messaging has uh, thankfully evolved and it's more, it's more broad, you know, it's more, it's about safe air and clean water because who can be against that? Um, that kind of broadens the message and the thinking around it. But, you know, to your point, um, there still are folks who are uh, anti-facts and, you know, my, you know, personal philosophy is I usually start with facts and then that's where you can get um, into um, perspectives. But if, if we can't agree that it's currently July, then, you know, we can't have a conversation with, with one another. And I want to have conversations with people who agree that it's currently July. If you think it's December and there's, you know, three feet of snow outside, then you just, you can't be a product, productive participant of, of this conversation. So I really do think that, um, you know, at least conceptually, it's having the conversations and the actions with folks who are really uh, being a part of a, a, a factual based conversation, as opposed to over acquiescing to people who still want to say, well, no, it's actually December and there's 10 feet of snow outside. Um, I, I think a lot of that is um, effort and um, futility. And um, sometimes I think a lot of times it's an intentional diversionary tactic you know we're trying to convince folks of this and quite literally the the world is on fire so yeah. you know a lot of that might be kind of philosophical but at least that's kind of my uh, approach is going to where there's actual um energy and and uh, attention and respect given to an issue and you know looking for the people who are looking for you um and you know really starting the work there uh, unfortunately, a lot of times some people will will never be on board. But I, I, I you know, one one monkey shouldn't stop a show, and you know, go to where the energy is. The problem is it's happening way too often that yeah. one does yeah. stop the show. And how do we how do we get beyond that? That's a fantastic question. Um, you know, I'm a classically trained grassroots community organizer, and, you know, the essence of organizing is building power to, to make a difference and, and to make a change. And at the core of that is largely people power, because you're usually uh, outnumbered. Um, you're usually out-resourced. You're usually going up against a lot of uh, systems and, you know, the work itself is, is incremental, but I do believe in the, in the power um, of doing that. And, you know, I had a conversation with a, a, a friend and in many ways a, a mentor recently, the reality of a lot of the work that uh, myself or others have been involved with, one way to view it is it's, it's really a tour of duty. I am not aware of any issue, certainly no issue that I've been involved with that completely got wrapped up, uh, certainly not during, during my lifetime. You, you pick the issue and, you know, things that you thought were settled weren't quite settled. We look at, you know, what, regardless of where you fall on that issue, the recent uh, decision of the Supreme Court with, you know, Roe versus Wade, there's people generations ago who thought that was kind of a settled issue. So, you know, uh, I say that to say that, you know, I, I think that some effort, any effort does make a difference. However, the reality is, uh, unfortunate reality is you, 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 you're just on a tour of duty. That issue likely will not be settled. You just do what you can with, uh, with who you can in, in the moment that you're given. It certainly isn't going to be settled for a while. And um, we, it, it, we find an, an interesting situation. I'm starting to hear a little bit more in the news. Let's take Roe v. Wade. Yes. I'm hearing a little bit more in the news that the the conservative arm of of this whole discussion wants to get back to conservative 
religious principles and bringing mm-hmm. God back into um, our states and so on. And what amazes me about that is that these are some of the same people who who talk about religious freedom and separation of church and state. Yeah. But when yeah. they open those discussions, what are they doing? They're not separating church and state. Yeah. And yeah. that is it is so unfortunate. The the message becomes hypocrisy related in in some way, hypocritical. Yeah, absolutely. That's you know, and I am um, you know, I'm an issue based person. I, I don't you know bleed D or R, and you know, I, I believe what what do the issues call for? You know, uh, issues of problem with a, a solution. But I you know it does you know. Uh, really, I just don't understand the the, the hypocrisy um, or the, the lack of um, consistent um, po- political uh, a policy agenda or platform. Um, you know, it, it can't be you know separation of, of of church and state. Yet we need to bring you know God or or once God back in, into the discussion. It can't be um, you know. Um, over uh, acquiescing to uh, capitalistic uh, structures um, at the expense of, of workers. And, you know, it's just the continuous hypocrisy from, you know, sometimes literally from one day uh, to another or one week to another. I just, you know, I just really struggle with that. And, you know, I, I can, uh, you know, it's, it's helped me understand the the position and the the the, the consistency of it. Mm-hmm. Well, so here's another one to uh, to really make life a challenge for you. You mentioned a while ago the big eight, the big eight things that go into yes. DEI and so on. Did you notice what's missing out of that big eight? No. So to be that? so to be fair. You named eight different things, and not once, even though persons with disabilities make up roughly 25% of our population, disability isn't included in that. Yeah, and, and, um, and to my um, understanding, uh, that would fall under the ability under the, the social um, identifier. Well, um, I don't know whether I, I can can concur with that. The the bottom line is that when we talk about diversity and we talk about the different groups, we never discuss the concept of persons with disabilities. It's mm. it is some social, but it's social with everyone. Um, and it's it's very much with with a part of disabilities and a significant part, a physical issue, but mm. yet it's not discussed. And one of my favorite stories about that in an illustration of it is that in 2004, when Kerry was running for president, we were living in Northern California and the Kerry for president people opened an office in San Rafael with California, which was about seven miles, eight miles from where we lived. And a person in a wheelchair went by because there had been an announcement that once the office opened, there was going to be a party. And when the office opened and everyone started to learn about it, this person in a chair happened to drove by and noticed that there were stairs going up to the second floor where the office was located, but there was no elevator. Mm. And he pointed that out and that became very visible in the news because he and others said, well, but we can't come to be at the, at the event, the celebration and so on. And the carry people said, well, yeah, we're going to work on it. We're aware of it. We understand it. We're going to fix it. And as these people then pointed out, the the people in chairs, but we're not able to be there and be a part of the party. Mm-hmm. And and that's the issue is mm-hmm. it's a lot more than a social kind of thing. There are so many examples of blind people, for example, who grow up and they're told by educators and so-called professionals in the field oh, you don't need to learn Braille because you can listen to books. You can listen to information. Audio is available. You can listen to it on your computer with synthetic speech. 
And the question that I and others ask is, then why do we teach sighted kids to read and we don't emphasize teaching Braille to blind kids? The, the problem is it goes well beyond just a, a social stigma. It's still a total lack of inclusion. Agreed. Agreed. And thank you for, for sharing that. Um, yeah, I, I absolutely include that with my, you know, working understanding of that both uh, physical and cognitive um, Correct. Uh, ability with, within my, my definition of, of the, uh, the big eight, if you will, specific with, a, uh, with ability. Um, I recently did a, a, a I guess we call it an intensive uh, experience with uh, members, leaders within the uh, the uh, disabled community to uh, to learn more about that over the course of a, a few months, and you know to be more uh, cognizant and aware and sensitive to that, uh, even within my own work and own you know personal understanding. And you know, one thing that's really interesting too is so you know, kind of the the world went uh, online. Um, within, you know, the past upwards of two plus years. And a lot of the tools that we're using are uh, new to some uh, communities, but they were kind of a necessity for others. And, you know, um, but oftentimes when we do use tools such as the, the Zooms of the world, they often don't accommodate members of those that that community who have you know the dis yeah. disabled community who have you know so a lot of ironies kind of in um uh you know the, the how the tools are used if they are used and you know i'm big fan of yielding to and you know being humble to folks who might be more knowledgeable and experienced in those areas so you know, I have tried to be intentional about that. Like, hey, yeah, you know, we're using these tools, but are they accommodating the folks who, you know, were using them for years, uh, years prior to? So uh, well, well stated, Mike. What's really ironic about that, and you raise a really good point, and so I'll deal with it in terms of disabilities, but I bet we can take it in other places. Well, we can actually, but What's what's really ironic is that as we have become a more technologically based race, and especially we'll we'll say in this country, and as we have brought more things online and created electronic environments to present those things, it in reality is incredibly much easier to make information available to persons with disabilities because mm -hmm. now there, there is audio. There are also for blind people, refreshable braille displays. The internet could be constructed or websites could be constructed so that persons who can't use a mouse, say uh, persons who happen to be quadriplegic and can't move a mouse with their hands can have better access and that the websites can be created because the guidelines have been created to do so the the ability to make websites much more inclusive is there yet 98 percent of websites are not demonstrating any ability or demonstrating any specific effort to make them accessible and if a lot of those websites are accessible is simply by accident because they're very simple websites and don't have a lot of the more complex coding and so on. But the re or like books, the reality is there are so many ways that information could be presented in an inclusive way, but we're getting further and further away from doing that, which is extremely unfortunate. Yes. Yeah. To, to that point, when I was uh, going through the, um, the in intensive learning experience I mentioned with the, uh, uh, disabled community, one of the um, instructors or, or leaders mentioned that she has never seen personally experienced a website that had a triple A compliance. So there's a, there's an A rating, which is the lowest, right. there's double A, which is mid range. And she had personally never experienced a triple A uh, across whether it's public sector or private sector. Um, and you know, that's, that's pretty telling, right. Um, uh, that, you know, we're, we're going into some say web 3.0, but 
we still haven't gotten up to snuff in terms of kind of the, the just the basics. Well, as early as 2010, um, for example, um, the Obama administration, so I'll just say the government made a commitment to create standards for governments and contractors and so on, at least to make sure that websites and all of their information was available, but yet it still hasn't happened and it's 12 years. There are so many other things. We, we have seen the advent of quiet cars and hybrid vehicles and so on. Mm. And those vehicles, when they're quiet, then mean that some of us won't hear them. Mm -hmm. And it took finally the National Institute of um, Highway and Traffic Safety, NHTSA, to come along and discover that the accident rate across the board was 1.5 times higher regarding quiet vehicles and hybrid vehicles and pedestrians than regular internal combustion engines. Point being, it isn't just, say, blind people that rely on those engine noises. We all do. Yes. And yet it, it, it is still something that today the final standard to make it a requirement for vehicles to make some sort of a noise hasn't been promulgated by the government, even though the law was passed, the Pedestrian Enhancement Safety Act was passed in 2011 or signed in 2011 to make that a requirement. It's, it's unfortunate. We still make life so difficult. And I'm, and I'm not saying that to pick on, on you in any way, but, um, but rather to say we, we need to recognize the need to be more inclusive. So the big eight probably really ought to be the big nine, but you know, that's, that's still an issue that probably people need to address because it still comes down to being afraid of what's different from what we experience regularly. Absolutely. Point, point taken and uh, ha have some familiarity with that. I'm the, uh, the owner of a, of a hybrid car. And yeah, it, it freaked me out when I took it on a test drive. I, I didn't think the car was on. I was in, inside the car going to operate it. And I heard nothing. I had to go out and ask for help saying, <laughs> yeah, can you, can you, <laughs> what's going on here? Like, Oh no. They said it's, it, it's just quiet like that when, you know, the, the engine's not running. When, right. the, oh. when the engine's not running. Yeah. 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 Well, and, and um, one of my pet gripes is the Tesla vehicles. Uh, they're totally quiet. But the big issue is, or a another big issue, and Tesla doesn't make them make noise yet, but another big issue is you really control most of it from a touchscreen. Doesn't that take mm. your eye off the road to need to read the screen and do things on the screen? Um Tesla would say, but we're automating a lot of the, the normal driving tasks, which is true, but still we're encouraging people to look at the screen rather than utilizing other senses like audio information to give people what they need to be able to more effectively drive the car and make that touch screen or parts of it for passengers accessible so that people other than those who look at the screen can sit in the passenger seat and tune the radio like any other passenger would do in any other vehicle that isn't so touchscreen oriented. You know, the, we're talking about technology and you mentioned kind of uh, the audio uh, assistant devices earlier. I'm, I'm curious to know your, your take on say the, um, the Alexas and the Google devices of, of the world. Um, and where do you, you see that as potentially being, helpful or, or a hindrance or anything in between? Well, I think that devices like Google Home, Alexa, and so on make it possible for all of us to more effectively interact with information. So I use a, primarily, although I have both, but I use primarily the Amazon Echo device mm -hmm. here. I don't want to use that other word because otherwise it'll talk yes. to me. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And yeah, I know that will. Actually, I've even, changed even it. Even commercials Alexa. sometimes. <laughs> oh, I know. Actually, I've changed it from Alexa to computer, but I and I turned the volume <laughs> down so it won't really talk. But but the reality is that it that it gives me some access to things 
that saved me a lot of time. Whether whichever device I use, uh, I happen to be in front of, I can ask it to give me information about one subject or another. I can turn the lights on and off. Uh, I can arm my alarm system. And all that is doubly relevant for me because my wife happens to be a person in a wheelchair. So a lot of those things she can't easily do either. And so the fact is that we both take a lot of advantage of having those devices. And I think they're extremely valuable to have. And that's actually kind of what I was getting at, that those same technologies and techniques could be put in vehicles in a more significant way or take the Apple iPhone and its speech technology voiceover or Android phones and their speech technology talk back. Why is it that we don't have automobiles providing us much more voice output rather than dealing with the touchscreen? Why is it that the Alexas don't default to providing verbal information output wise, much less me being able to provide information and command of the vehicle input wise with my voice. And, and it doesn't matter whether you're blind or sighted or whatever. Why is it that we're not taking a lot more advantage today of a lot of the technology that is already developed? And part of the answer is we're locked into the way we've always done it. Like we've talked about before and we just don't change. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it is something that we really ought to look at over time um, and see how we can, um, well, not how, but I think the hows are there, but to make a concerted effort to make a change. I work for a company called Accessibi, and one of the values of Accessibi is it's a very scalable technology that makes internet websites more accessible. It started with an artificial intelligent widget as we call it, an AI widget that can look at a site and add a lot of coding to the browser end rather than doing it at the website end, but that makes the browser think that the website is more accessible. Does it, does it do everything? No, it doesn't because AI hasn't progressed that far, but it does a lot. That plus the other aspects of accessibility that are manually controllable can make all the access needs of a website available. But yet, well, not but yet. So Accessibi was formed intentionally with the idea that over time we need to get rid of the accessibility gap. As I said, 98% of all websites tend not to be accessible, mm -hmm. and we're not changing that. Accessibi inexpensively begins to change that. So Accessibi has a goal of making the entire internet world accessible by 2025. It's a very aggressive goal. And there are people who still stick with the idea that, well, we got to manually code things because that's the only way to completely <laughs> do the job. Yeah. And if we look at a lot of the websites that the manual coders produce, it's not necessarily doing the job either. But the reality is it's fear that prevents things from happening sooner than they are. I'm curious. So I'm not sure how um, familiar or uh knowledgeable you are about you know what's the metaverse and web 3.0 but curious to know you know your take on it a lot of the uh and I, i'm a techie by the way but a lot of the things i've been reading and following as we're talking comes to mind that it seems to be largely based on you know a visual experience you know there's the, the oculus you'll be able to see people doing this and doing that and you know, your thoughts on maybe um, what are some of the possibilities from your perspective uh, for that or even cautions that you might have as that technology gets gets developed in, in ways that it can be most most useful for a variety of people? Well, that's why I say the big eight really needs to be the big nine. Until we really bring disabilities into the conversation, we're not going to change it. And um, there there are things that, that in theory, Web 3.0 and the new um, web content accessibility guidelines as Web 3.0 comes out will do, but will they be implemented? 
you can make all the changes that you want, but until the conversation truly includes persons with disabilities, truly understands and includes those needs and makes it a part of what we do, things aren't going to change. Here's a better way to look at it. There are a number, and it's a relatively small number, of technological companies that really control the internet. you got Microsoft, right. Right. for example. You Amazon. have Apple, yeah. App, Amazon, Google, and a few others. And let's, let's go to the internet, WordPress. Yeah. Tell me one of them that makes true inclusion and accessibility part of what they do right from the outset. And I'll help you. The answer is none. Microsoft comes out with new versions of Windows or Microsoft a few years ago came out with a competitor um, to Zoom, Google or Microsoft Teams. Mm -hmm. And yet it took a while to make the app accessible um, for persons with disabilities, for blind people on a PC. It came out actually as an accessible app first. But the bottom line is it should have been done natively right from the outset. And no one disagrees with that but it doesn't happen. The iPhone, when it was first developed, was not accessible. It took the threat of a lawsuit to get Apple to deal with that. Even so, now that if you go buy an iPhone, it is accessible and all of the, the parts of an iPhone will verbalize, but there's nothing that guarantees that apps will have any level of accessibility. You know, I can go through any number of examples so until the conversation changes, then we're not going to see the real change that we want to have. And the reality is that the conversation can change and it will not only benefit those of us who really totally depend on it, but it will help the entire world. The, the fact is you can talk all day about how much more you can see with what will happen with Web 3.0 and so on. But the reality is eyesight is only one sense that we all have. And if we don't really begin to learn to use all of our other senses in conjunction with eyesight for those of us who have it, and if we don't accept that not everyone uses eyesight and there's nothing wrong with that and doesn't make us lesser beings, then we're not going to change the, the, the whole situation and become an inclusive society. Yes, here, here. But that we can do. Well, for you, have you always wanted to do what you're doing now? I, short answer is yes. I didn't know that you could make a career out of it. Um, I, you know, was, was a super volunteer. Um, that's kind of how I got my start, if you will, as a, as a tween, just, you know, volunteer stuff around the community be it self-organized or just getting involved in, in more formal programs or what have you and you know when you when you do more you get asked get asked to do more but I was in uh, the IT field professionally uh, prior to, to doing what I'm doing now and I you know again didn't realize you could do a career out of it it's just it, I considered it my work you know, I do it on the lunch hour or, um, you know, uh, off the clock, but, you know, I, I can just consider, I consider it now my, my vocation and my craft, but yeah, I quite literally didn't know, you know, realize that it was a, a profession, um, in, in that regard. What's a common myth of, um, that, that you can say that people have about what you do? <laughs> Oh, well, there's, there's a few. Um, I think one is that, you know, I coined my work as, as public affairs, which, you know, just kind of means I work with the public in a variety of ways that it is not, um, as I say, it's not just event planning. You know, oftentimes folks, they, they focus on the, the, the when and the where, you know, so what, you know, give us a date and a time, be it, you know, clients or what have you. And although that is a part of the work, that's the nature of the work for public affairs when you're engaging with communities, that's just a means to an end. 
and that um, there's ultimately different ways to engage with communities. So that's that's a misnomer. Or my uh, sometimes I say uh, frenemies in a uh, in public relations whom um, I work with, you know, uh, pretty regularly. But it's almost like a Venn diagram. There's there's some overlap. Uh, between mm-hmm. public relations and, and public affairs, but there's ultimately different end games as, as well. Whereas I would argue, you know, public relations is um, kind of, it, it's, it's, you know, it's painting the room. It's, it's, it's you know, uh, decorating, it, it's accessorizing the room and public affairs is uh, kind of, well, how does, how do people receive it? Do they receive it? Is it what they want it in the first place? How do you get to, uh, accommodating that room, so that those are a couple of the uh, common you know misnomers in terms of the nature of the work. And you know, again, uh, a lot of friends or family might think, "Oh, you know, Kobe's in politics," and it's um, <laughs> you know, I, I do have a background in, in legislative affairs as well as you know grassroots community organizing and consulting. So I have been on uh, each side of those those tables. However, that's uh, an oversimplification for for the nature of my work. I'm um, policy over politics and, you know, issues over, over party. Um, so those are kind of a, a common, you know, myths that I uh, try to dispel um, uh, often. There is nothing, it seems to me, no matter what we say about Washington and politics, but there's nothing like going to D.C. and walking the halls of Congress and meeting with elected officials and talking about issues when they're willing to do that. It's an awesome experience to be in, in DC where, you know, all this stuff happens and it's a lot of fun to do. Yes. Yes. At one point in my career, DC was a, 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 a kind of a third home for me. I was there at least every two to three months uh, doing advocacy and or lobbying work and you no know, uh, couple of state houses around the country and, and city halls in respective cities as well. And, you know, a lot of my work, certainly in its current capacity, I look at as, as connecting the, uh, say, the, the main streets and the Martin Luther King avenues with the, you know, city hall avenues. And, you know, what, what, is that, uh, what does that work look like or what could that look like to, to move communities and move issues forward? And it's really great when you find people who are willing to learn and explore and recognize that you have some different experiences than they do and they want to really understand you. And I have found that any number of times in Washington when meeting with people. And it's so cool when that happens. Yes. Yes, absolutely. So you have, I am sure, been mentored by people that helped you move along and so on. Who's your your favorite mentor or who really mentored you? Oh, wow. Um, I had a teacher in um, junior, junior high and high school, uh, Mr. Holloway, who I, I believe is still um, still with us. I actually he came to mind uh, about a couple of months ago, and I sent him uh, a note online through, through Facebook just to thank him. I, I don't think he ever realized the impact that he had um, on my life, just as a student, um, I had him for a homeroom in high school, and he also taught uh, history as well as African American history, which, you know, sadly is is an elective in most uh, school school systems. And I remember the first day of class, I think it was just kind of um, American or uh, colonial colonial history, as, as I like to say. And, you know, first day of class, we all have our textbooks out and, you know, we're just ready to learn. And he says, well, y'all can put those away. Ain't nothing but lies in them anyway. <laughs> and it was, wow, you know, I'm just a, just a 16, 17 year old kid. And, you know, everyone, you hear thumps, everyone just drops their textbooks on the, on the ground. And he taught just kind of the, off, you know, what I got from that, just off, authenticity. Um, and you know, that just, that, that stuck with me, uh, ran track a little bit in high school and, um, uh, coach T, uh, Jimmy Turner, 
Uh, I believe he's, he is still with us and was just a very graceful, humble. Uh, he, he asked a lot from you, but in a very way that was, um, he wanted the best for you, very re respectful and lessons that I still carry with me off of the track. And he really cared about us. And for many of us, quite frankly, we weren't exposed to uh, male figures or, or role models in our lives. So a lot of us really looked up to him and never wanted to, you know, disappoint him um, on or off the track. So those were two, um, you know, people who I considered were definitely influential in, in my life and certainly in those kind of young and impressionable years and, you know, lessons that still I uh, think about often and, and carry with me uh, now personally and professionally. Isn't it interesting how often we remember teachers that were a great influence on us? Um, a lot of people may say that they weren't necessarily charismatic, but the reality is they loved what they did. That got passed on to all of us because I remember a number of my teachers and talk about them. I know in my book, Thunderdog, we, we talk about Dick Herbelsheimer, who I met. Uh, he was my sophomore geometry teacher, and we still talk. And uh, I remember any number of my other teachers, which is really, I think, important and cool. And I'm glad that they were a part of my life because they definitely had an effect on me. So I'm with you. Yeah. Yeah. Let me ask this. If you could meet and talk with any historical figure, who would that be? Oh wow! And this is coming from a from a, from a nerd in uh, history history. Well, book. that's why I asked. <laughs> oh, the, the name that immediately comes to mind is the the late great uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, mm -hmm. and I, I think my opinion is regardless of what you think of him, it's it's probably still. He's underappreciated uh, for one of the most documented figures, certainly in American history, uh, be it books that he wrote personally or people close to him wrote about him. Or, you know, if we want to go down what the, what the government, you know, kind of uh, kept, kept tabs on, extremely well-documented person, but Oftentimes, for nefarious reasons, um, his his words have been twisted. His uh, mm -hmm. ideologies have been, you know, taken out of context. And you know, I think he's a fascinating figure because you know, um, you know, Dr. Cornell West says that his, you know, Dr. King's image has become Santa, uh, become like Santa Claus, Santa Claus, Claus Fied, I believe is the term that he uses. But just the the grace and the patience that he that he had um and you know he you know when he was taken from us you know following 14 years of being you know jailed bombed harassed um etc cetera, etc cetera, and ultimately you know um shot in the face as i like like to tell folks yeah. he had a I believe a 34% approval rating, you know, um, and, you know, he's lionized now, but, you know, again, he was yeah. taken, taken from us, which I think is really not um, mentioned in that light. Just, you know, just to have 15 minutes, you know, with, with the man in person, just to uh, absorb the, the source of that patience and hope. And, you know, uh, which is something that, you know, I, I uh, think we all could benefit from. I'm with you. Um, and it makes perfect sense. I think it's, again, our historical figures, when we really study them, do set a lot of examples that, that we ought to emulate. And, and it's so bad that his approval rating when he was alive was not higher than it was. But again, it's all about growth, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So you asked me to ask you a question I've got to ask, which is what's one insult that you've had in your life that you're proud of? 
<laughs> you brought that up. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm I'm known uh, as I say to 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 talk that talk. Uh, I do challenge. Um, I'm known to be a boat rocker, and I, I've you know that goes back. My mother would tell you that's just just always been a part of who I am. And it's not to be provocative for the sense of being provocative. I just right. I question why things are. And, um, you know, certainly when I was younger, I knew that's who I was, but might have been a little kind of, you know, felt bad about it at times. But I fully embrace that. You know, I am a I'm an activist who happens to be a consultant. You will find very few consultants, particularly for what I do, who, who will say that publicly. They might maybe whisper that in closed rooms. Um, no, you, you know what you're getting with, with Kobe, with, with New Reach, and it is to challenge status quo, um, as to challenge, you know, why are things the way they are? How can they be better? How can they be, how can you help put, you know, individuals or communities in a better place? And that does require being um, provocative, you know, not just for the sake of being it, you know, I mentioned the late, great Dr. King, he was considered provocative, you know, right. he was talking about justice and, you know, in, in the land of the free, and that was considered to be, you know, <laughs> rocking the boat. So for me, it's, it's all very relative. A lot of the folks whom uh, we might look up to, it, it's afterwards, it's after they've gone through hell, sometimes after they've been taken from us, it's because they did have um a, a a vision and they question things and i i'm not shy about doing that but it's it's for a reason uh and, and the spirit uh behind that is is to put things people situations um in a better place what are three books you would recommend that uh people ought to read one i uh recently read is uh 4000 weeks um it wow a very powerful book the the premise of the book is really maybe a paradigm shift of how to live a fulfilled life um with the time that you're given on this earth and it really puts your own life in perspective and you know not to give too much of the book away but you know, we're, we're not all that important um, in the grand scheme of things, and that's okay. Um, the Power of Now is a mm -hmm. very uh, powerful book. That's, that's a book I actually want to reread. I think that's a book that arguably you might be able to read uh, annually and still get something out of it, and um, it might, might humble you in a bit. And... Wow. Um, a third, I, I think anything, again, the late, great Dr. King, he has autobiographies. Um, he, he did, you know, write a few books while he was with us on this earth. And I think you can't go wrong with anything that he has, uh, he has written. Um, and, you know, so that might be cheating a bit. That's, that's, that's two plus. But um, those are some that I would, I would recommend, be it titles and or authors. You said something that's really interesting. You mentioned the power of now. Isn't it great when you find a book that you read, and that you can reread, and that you can reread and reread, and every time you discover something new in it? Yes. And what I like about is that, you know, the books I mentioned aren't so much prescriptive their experiences you know right. i think that so many things we want okay what are the the three tips to life give them to me and it's you know that's just that's not how things that's snake that's oil. not that's, how it works that's not how it works life right. is an experience and with experiences you can get something out of it um each time you, you kind of go through it well, before we wrap up, we have to go over one more revelation regarding you, and that is that you are a fan of basketball and specifically, yes, absolutely, the Los Angeles Lakers. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Life, How did that happen? Fan. You know, I, um, I originally grew up kind of watching baseball, um, 
at the time, particularly in the, the early 90s, it was kind of that transition where it was less baseball, more NBA on TV. And I wasn't particularly a fan of any one team, but I just remember catching a game, probably was on uh, NBC at the time, of, of the Lakers. It was kind of the, the later years of the Lake Show, and it was, wow, they played differently than any other team. They have fast breaks continuously, and they, they <laughs> run the floor, and magic, just being magic, you know, with, with the ball, and it just – it really resonated with me. It wasn't just throwing the ball in the post and, you know, taking 20 dribbles with, with the center of the power forward. No, they were dishing the ball all over the court and just the razzle dazzle. So I think that's what really uh, got me was, was the Lake show and uh, been a lifelong fan um, uh, ever since. Yeah. And hoping for a better season this year. I, I, oh, I'm hoping for a better season. I will add. I, I, must, yeah. <laughs> I must admit that for me, getting attracted to the Lakers, to the Dodgers, and, and to others, I got spoiled by the announcers. L.A. always had the best announcers mm. um, in, in my view. I mean, there's nobody who could beat Vin Scully. And with the Lakers, Chick Hearn, Although yes. I also yeah. got to listen in Boston to Johnny most, but still no one did a game like Chick Hearn. And yeah, yeah. You know, it was just kind of amazing. And Dick Enberg out here also who did the angels and, and did um, some of the football stuff as well. So we miss them all, but they're, they're, they're what attracted me in a way because I, I learned sports from those people, mm -hmm. um, which was great. Well, I really want to thank you for being a part of this today and being with us. If people want to reach out to you and learn more about you, how can they do that? Yeah, thank you. You can check me out. Um, New Reach's website is newreachcommunity.com. Or you can also follow me on LinkedIn, where I'm uh, pretty active on there as well. You can just search for Kobe, that's C-O-B-Y, C. Williams. Um, and I'd love to uh, connect with folks. Well, great. And I hope you who are listening will reach out. Uh, I think we've had a, a great discussion and I think we've given each other and lots of people who are listening a great deal to think about, which is what makes this whole podcast series a lot of fun. So thank you for being here with us. And I want to thank you all for listening. You're welcome to reach out to me. Would love to hear what you think. Feel free to email me at michaelhi at accessibe.com. Accessibe is A-C-C-E-S-S-I-B-E.com. Please, wherever you're listening to this podcast, give us a five-star rating. We appreciate your ratings and your comments. They're invaluable and they help us. If you know of anyone else who ought to be on the podcast, and Kobe, you included, please feel free to let us know or reach out or provide introductions. But once again, Kobe, thank you very much for being here and being a part of Unstoppable Mindset. You're welcome, Michael. Thank you so much for the invitation and uh, be well.